Hello, and welcome to our presentation, Humor and Surprises in Mexican Cooking and Culture by Patricia Merrill Marquez. My name is Christiana Telly, and I work with the Events Committee for Mujeres en Cambio, and we are very happy that you are joining us today. Patricia has a rich background. She's worked as an architect, a city and regional planner, a real estate broker, and owner of a bed and breakfast, Mexican cooking vacation. But today, the focus of her talk is going to be on this book, her book, the Buen Provecho book, capturing the spice of Mexico through popular food and sayings. The book will be available and some of the proceeds, if you choose to buy it, will go to Mujeres en Cambio. And for that, we are greatly appreciative. You are truly in for a treat today. Her informative and entertaining talk is full of golden nuggets. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the help of Karen Moon, who has given us expert technical support, as well as Rhonda Lerner for creating our publicity and her work with social media. But lastly, we want to thank you for joining us today. It's through your financial support that we are able to help young women in rural communities around San Miguel so that they might complete their education. Thank you for joining us. And now I introduce to you Patricia Merrill Marcus. Hola, hola. Muchos saludos a todos. First of all, I want to thank Mujeres en Cambio for having invited me and given me this opportunity to share with you all uh, my book, the Buen Provecho book, and some of the stories that I have related to Mexican food expressions. The reason I chose this title and the reason I got inspired for working with the book is that Coming from a family of linguists, uh, especially Spanish-English, having parents from the U.S. and from Mexico, uh, it was very, very disturbing for me to constantly hear people at the table say, Bon Appetit, when we have this absolutely wonderful saying, Buen Provecho, sometimes just Provecho, even Provechito, which means so much more than just good appetite. What it means is I'm wishing you well with your eating. I'm wishing you the best. I'm not envying your food. Part of it comes from our background of being a bit superstitious and having uh, the thought that maybe you're envying my food and that would send me bad vibrations. So therefore, buen provecho. And I often say, buen provecho la vida. May life do good for you. So having said that, I want to tell you about dichos. Dichos are expressions. They are sometimes uh, considered cliched, but we don't consider them cliched here. We consider them part of our culture and part of our general knowledge as to what is appropriate and what should be said and how we should behave. So in this particular book, I've collected over 400 different expressions that tell us about food-related items. Therefore, People who speak with many dichos, which people do, are called dicharacheros. They say dichos all the time. And one of the famous ones for doing this, who I'll mention several times in my talk, was Cantinflas. Cantinflas was uh, one of our most uh, e extraordinary comedians. And uh, as far as his uh, dichos, there were many. Uh, and often only a part of a dicho is said because we say, al buen entendedor, pocas palabras. He who understands well needs only a few words. Therefore, in these dichos, you might hear that there's a, two phrases in the dicho or the expression or the idiom, depending on how you look at the word or the phrase. And many times we only say the first part because the rest of it is totally understood. One of the ways that I explain food expressions to uh, classes is that um, if you can imagine my mother, a 19-year-old girl from San Miguel de Allende, moving up to Massachusetts with her newlywed husband and to 
uh, the New England area and speaking very little English in 1949. Therefore, she hears, um, that's not my cup of tea. And she's looking everywhere for the cup of tea, not knowing that it's just an expression that comes from the culture of uh, the Boston Tea Party, the black tea that was drunk. Some people had it with one sugar or two lumps of sugar, milk or lemon juice, it all depended. So in Spanish, we have something that is similar. In most countries, in most languages, there's something similar because it's all part of our human existence. We have the mero mole. We say, mi mero mole, that's just my mole. And part of that is that many people think there's only one type of mole the one that has chocolate, because it's the most famous, the most exotic, maybe even the most delicious. But the reality is mole is a word that comes from the Nahuatl muli, which means to grind. So basically mole is a sauce. And you can have green mole, you can have yellow mole, you can have red mole, you can have the uh, one with chocolate. Uh, in Oaxaca, they usually have a, um, uh, they propose that you have uh, the taste of seven different moles that they make there, and many of them depend on which chiles you use in them. So definitely, as far as uh, something being your mero mole, it means it's just what you wanted. So I will add an expression that tells us time to get going with this little talk, and it's manos a la masa. And what it means is our hands are going to go into the masa, which is the dough made from the uh, maíz that's been nixtamalizado, and therefore we work with it to bake any number of delicious dishes, starting from a plain tortilla to uh, tamales or to whatever we need to do, manos a la masa. Here we go. So the, we have a culture of bread and pastries, very much consumed here in Mexico. Here in San Miguel, we have a wonderful bakery called La Colmena, meaning bumblebee, which is 100 years old, which most Americans refer to as the Blue Door Bakery. Now we have many, many other bakeries, wonderful bread here. So bread, wheat came with the Spaniards and with them came many of their food sayings that are related to bread because they were used for centuries before they even came here. Some of the more fun ones, a quien le dan pan que llore. Who will they give bread to that would complain about it? It's like a gift horse in the house. Why would you complain? Another is con pan y vino se anda el camino. With bread and wine, you can follow your path. Another is about someone totally oblivious. And we say, no huele ni el pan caliente. He can't even smell baking bread. He's just so out of it. It has become a custom to have bread with many, many of the meals. And uh, bolillos, which comes from the French pastry, uh, the baguette sort of a, uh, a bread, is uh, very common. And therefore, we have, uh, with the bolillos, we make tortas. Tortas are sandwiches uh, made with this little baguette and different numbers of fillings, types of filling. And uh, a poor child might take a, a torta made of beans, refried beans, whereas a rich child might have ham and cheese inside his torta. And typically, the torta was taken at, to school by a child every day to eat at recess or at lunchtime. And so that was when you were supposed to eat your torta, which was at recess. So one of the humorous and a little bit out of line, perhaps, expressions is, se comió la torta antes del recreo. She ate her torta before recess. So what does this mean? This means she broke the rules. She had sex before she was married, and therefore she's pregnant. Bread has been part of what was brought by the Spaniards. They were the ones that had the wheat, and when we brought the wheat, to, they brought the wheat here to Mexico, they brought the culture of pastries. And the Spaniards have often felt that they are, because they eat the uh, wheat in bread, they're superior. So I have even had, when I was doing my book, uh, one of the ones that participated in it, was uh, of Spanish uh, heritage. And of course, when we were taking pictures of different, talking about different dishes of Mexican cuisine made with maize, he, he didn't know anything about it, even though he was in his 40s, 50s, and lived all his life in Mexico, because he was a Spaniard and they only ate bread. And I had a guest at my one-time bed and breakfast here, who also told me that she was 16 years old from a Spanish family, and yet, 
when she was going on her first date, she had to say to her mother, Mom, how do you eat a taco? Uh, I've never eaten a taco, and they're taking me to tacos for dinner. How do you eat a taco? So with this, I want to change to what maize is. Maize is one of the pillars of our food, of our nutrition in Mexico. And the maize is valuable because it's been nixtamalizado, which means it's been through a process which includes uh, softening it. It used to be with a, a substance that was uh, in the ponds outside of Mexico City, but now it's done often with lime. And so it gains uh, certain properties that it didn't have with the uh, normal corn, and it softens it, and we can use it to make many things. So that's why when we talk about our masa and we start making our tortillas, we uh, have a masa that has been softened and worked with. So what do we do? We take a ball of it and we press it to make a tortilla. And it's very important for people to understand to, if you make your tortillas, that there's a right side and a wrong side to the tortilla. The one that hits the griddle first is going to be thicker. You don't turn it until it's mostly cooked. So then you turn it, and then when you turn it the second time, the thin part puffs up. And that's when you know you've got a real homemade tortilla. With the machinery, I'm not sure whether it puffs quite the same, but if you go to the uh, tortilla um, establishments uh, that have the little machinery here in, in San Miguel, you can see them puff up. The other thing about tortillas is you need to know about the level of hydration, because a new tortilla is great to just roll up. You can bite into it. But if it's an older tortilla, then you can use it for enchiladas. Because if you use a new tortilla for enchiladas, it will all get messy and fall apart. There's too much humidity in it. And then if your tortillas are really getting on in there, then you don't want to waste them. You cut them up or rip them up into pieces, and then you can make chilaquiles with them. You lightly fry the chips, and then you pour salsa on them and decorate them, and you have Chilaquiles, a tribute to the frugality and the wisdom of a new wife, as in the words of Cantinflas, again, our wonderful comedian, no girl should be able to marry until she knows how to make chilaquiles. The Spaniards were convinced that wheat was much, much better than the maize. And as a matter of fact, until the 1920s, when it was discovered that, yes, there was a nutritious value to maize when it's gone through the nixtamalización process, which turns it into the masa for making into dishes. Until then, there was the thought still that wheat was so much superior. Therefore, one of the dichos is a falta de pan, tortilla. If you lack bread, you'll settle for a tortilla, something lowly that only the people, the poor people would eat or the people that can't afford bread. And yet, now that we have the tortilla and that we know that it's absolutely a wonderful, nutritious item, uh, we eat tortillas in some families. The poorer families still might eat a, a kilo or a kilo and a half a day, whereas I perhaps might have three in a week. And that's just a preference of each person in their own diet. So we talk about someone that's a bit arrogant, and we might say, a todo le llaman cena hasta una tortilla con sal. He's pretending that he's got something big going on. So he calls it dinner, and all he's given you is a tortilla with salt on it. Another person that thinks he's quite special gives himself his own taco. Se da su taco. He thinks he's so great. Uh, if you're wondering, if you're being slighted, you might say, ¿Qué? Mis, ¿Que mis enchiladas no tienen queso? My enchiladas don't have cheese. I'm below you. And that's another way that we might be able to express some sort of a message through one of these expressions. We also say someone is a taco de ojo. Is eye candy attractive to you? You might say it's a taco for my eye. And then back to the chilaquiles, which are used, uh, made with the tortillas that have become stale and dry because then they can be crisped easily, salsa put on them, and use. It's kind of like the bread pudding in the uh, bread eating culture where you never throw bread away, you let it dry, and then you incorporate it into a bread pudding. Here, the chilaquiles use your oldest tortillas that have dried out, and you can turn them into a wonderful dish, a tribute 
to uh, frugality and the care that a wife would put into the household, which is why our comedian, uh, Cantinflas, that I mentioned before, uh, always said, a girl cannot get married until she knows how to make chilaquiles. We have many humorous ways of letting somebody know they're a little bit too big for their britches, that maybe they think they're too special. So one of the ones we say is, se cree muy salsa, he thinks he's quite the salsa. Another is, le echa mucha crema sus tacos, he puts too much cream on his tacos, he thinks his tacos are worthy of more cream than most anybody. Uh, se cree la divina, envuelta en huevo. What does this mean? She thinks she's divine in an egg batter. Why? Because anything in egg batter is going to be nicer than not having the egg batter when, you know, food was maybe not as abundant. And we have a culture of putting anything and everything into little patties that have egg batter in it, and then they are divine. Then the very special person that thinks he's so good, he eats beans and he burps up chicken. <laughs> so. We have another saying that says, you can't whistle and eat pinole. Why? Because pinole is the ground up roasted maize that's almost like powder, like crumbs. And if you eat it, it sticks to the saliva in your mouth. So you, of course you couldn't uh, whistle and eat pinole at the same time, but some people think they're so special they can. So there is pork cracklings, and we call them chicharron. They're very crispy and they crackle. And one way of using the chicharrones in a saying is saying, here only my chicharrones crackle. But then, if you're so special you think only your chicharrones crackle, then you're too full of yourself. So another similar uh, expression in certain South American countries that would be able to be used in Mexico also is, solo su chocolate hace espuma. Only her chocolate foams at the top because we have the little molinillo that we keep rubbing between our hands and it foams up. And the bigger the foam, the better the foam in the chocolate, the higher quality it was considered. Back to the chicharron. There is an expression that says, me están dando chicharron. It means they're actually sacrificing me. They're killing me. They're doing away with me. And with this, I want to share a little story about uh, my mother's experience in the early 50s up in Boston when the movie Around the World in 80 Days had just come out. This movie has as the one of the main stars uh, playing the part of a witty little Frenchman, our Mar Mexican comedian, Cantinflas. So Cantinflas is playing the part of a witty Frenchman. And in one of the parts of the movie, American Indians have tied him up to a tree or a post, and they're going to burn his feet. And very quietly, under his breath, distinctly, he says in Spanish, Me están dando chicharrón. And my mother cracked up. She was sure she was the only one that caught his humor in this movie in all of the Boston area. So how do we eat chicharrón? Um, one of the simplest ways is just a piece of nice, crunchy, crackly chicharron, and you put on it pico de gallo. What is pico de gallo? Pico de gallo is many chopped up little items, like a rooster could pick up with his bill, and you put those on it and some lemon juice. One of the best ones is a pico de gallo guanajuato, which would include also joconosles and um, chicharron. So you can put pico de gallo on the chicharron and eat it just like you would eat a tostada. In Leon, the city of Leon, it became very famous to have what they called wakamayas. They were selling them in the street, wakamaya being a parrot, a type of a parrot. But what they did is take a bolillo and fill it with chicharron and pico de gallo and lime juice, and you ate that, which would be very heavy, I am sure, but very much popular in the city of Leon. Another way to have your chicharron is in pozole verde, green pozole, which is served in several places in town, and they give it as a garnish. You put as much or as little of the chicharron into your pozole as you would like. And another way is uh, in chicharron in salsa verde, where you take the chicharron and you put it in the green sauce and you heat it, and your chicharron 
is now soft. It no longer crackles. It's uh, a nice filling for a taco or accompaniment to eggs. And those are some of the ways you can have chicharron. Now I'm going to talk to you about drinks. Uh, first of all, the Spaniards brought wine. They were the ones that drank wine. Mexicans drank other drinks made from, uh, you know, fermented cactuses or magueyes and so forth, which is a precursor to the uh, pulque and to the aguamiel and to the mezcal and to the tequila. But here, most people in their homes of the normal working class have aguas frescas. And I want to tell you a bit about aguas. First, aguas means watch out. And if somebody says that, you get out of the way or you pay attention to see if something is going to be disturbing to you or threatening to you. But it comes from the time when the chamber pots used to be emptied out of the balconies on the upstairs floor onto the street. And you better get out of the way because aguas, here comes the emptying of the aguas, the urine in the chamber pot. What we drink now is called aguas frescas. Aguas frescas are fresh drinks that are made like uh, agua fresca de limón would be a lemonade or agua fresca de naranja and orangeade. But the three most popular right now are agua de jamaica, jamaica which is uh, the hibiscus blossoms that would be boiled. Actually, it's the same ingredient in the red zinger tea. So if you have red zinger tea, you can make your agua de jamaica with your little tea bag. Uh, and also agua de horchata, which is made with uh, spiced and uh, blended um, rice that's been uh, cooked usually or sometimes not, but certainly um, it's a rice water. And then the tamarind one, those are the most famous uh, aguas frescas that are usually available in the local establishments. Then we have, ya que el agua no viene al molino, que vaya el molino al agua. What does that mean? That you should be inventive. If the water doesn't come to the water wheel, the water wheel should go to the water. And then we have different types of drinks. Some have more uh, elegant or costly ingredients, and others are more simple. So we can say, tú dirás que es de chía, pero es de horchata. You might say it's made of chía, but it's actually horchata, which is the rice water. Those are some examples of the different uh, drinks that have to do with aguas frescas. And one of the most uh, commonly known uh, is Mexican chocolate, and therefore drinks with chocolate are very well known. But there's another one that is not spoken about as much and that is very, very important to um, the people that couldn't afford chocolate. It's very, very expensive at some times. And that's the atole. It's also a hot beverage, but it's made with uh, mostly, or most of them are made with a ground maize. Although you can make atole with other starches, it's kind of like a thin, gravy, but sweetened and with maybe fruit in it. And so atole is a very basic starch made into a liquid. And one of the uh, sayings that is most common is, si con atole vas sanando, atole vamos dando. It's very good for the stomach. And if you're improving by drinking atole, let's keeping you, keep giving you atole. In my mother's case, in the last couple of weeks before she passed on from pancreatic cancer, Actually, that's the only thing she could tolerate. She had a tole every time she needed something to eat. So that is certainly one of them. We talk about somebody that has a tole in las venas. And that means that because it's thicker than what we would think blood would be, they're very slow to react, right? And therefore, we say they have a tole in their veins. And we say also that um, si se Se te olvida el nombre, pero no el meneadito, for people that seem to act like they don't know about their own culture anymore. They've gone up to the States and they come back and they can't quite remember the name of Atole, but they sure can remember how it was prepared and how they had to stir, stir the, the spoon when they were making it. Um, there's one more that says uh, that it's better to have Atole with a smile than chocolate with tears. Más vale atole con sonrisas que chocolate con lágrimas. So you're better to be, even if you're modest income, even if you're a poor family, if you're happy, that's much better than having the elegant chocolate and being unhappy in your life. 
In my book, I have included a chapter on herbs and teas because they're very, very important to our culture. As a matter of fact, there was a co codex, the Código Badiano, which had a very complete um, uh, description of many plants and herbs that were used for um, healing in the, in the uh, indigenous culture. And uh, there were two copies, and uh, one was uh, totally lost, and the second one was found many, many centuries later in the Vatican, and the Pope returned it to Mexico when he came on his visit. So it's a very, very wide, wide subject, and I'm only going to touch the little tip of it. So I'm going to tell you first a couple of the uh, expressions. One is, you know, you want the remedy and the cloth. Quieres el remedio y el trapito. You want the whole thing. What did that mean? The remedy was usually an herb or a piece of bark of some plant that you had turned into um, a tea or some sort of a liquid, and then you would put your cloth in it, and then you could put it on your chest or on your forehead or wherever it was needed, and therefore, to heal totally, you wanted the remedy and the cloth that went with it. So de allí, el remedio y el trapito. Another one that was often brought in uh, in families, and you would say to a child, please go tell your uh, aunt uh, Julie that you would like uh, a tea of ten me aquí. And so what we've done is run together the words ten me aquí, which means keep me here. So you send the child over to bring back a tea of ten me aquí, and they know they have to entertain you to give you a chance to finish doing because you're being a little bit of a bother. And that was used many times. I was sent to get ten de ten meki many times. Um, Ser canela fina would be a high-level cinnamon, meaning an elegant ingredient. And cinnamon, canela, makes a very warming tea. In our culture, kind of like the Chinese, there is um, the a knowledge that some ingredients are very warm and warming, and some are very cool and cooling, and some are just in between. So but from there, it happens that maybe your system has become cold and you need to warm it with a cinnamon tea or a guava in it. And uh, other things you want to cool off, and that's where cilantro and nopales come in because they're very cooling. So that's a difference also in how we uh, look at our food. And another amusing um, expression that was used in certain groups was que pasotes. And it's kind of a play on que epasotes, but it had nothing to do with epasotes. It was like the cartoon of Bugs Bunny, what's up, Doc? Que pasotes? Que pasotes? And that was another expression used there. I'm going to show you some of the herbs that I have in my garden that are used for healing. In my particular case, uh, my um, lady that worked for me and that sold me this property, uh, her grandmother was a healer, and so many of the uses of the herbs in different ways I learned throughout the years with her. And this is one. This is called ajenjo. Ajenjo in, and boldo is a different herb, but ajenjo is very, very bitter. And it's very good for the liver when you've been upset, when you've had a scare, when you've been very, very angry about something. And you can just bite a little leaf, which is really you'll... you'll uh, feel the bitterness in it, or we make teas with it and you drink a cup or two a day for a few days until you feel that, you know, that it's leveled off. In my own particular case, when I've had a very trying time, I might drink it three or four days in a row and it actually almost tastes sweet, and then suddenly it's very bitter again. I don't need it anymore. Over here, we have another plant, and this one I've had to trim back constantly because it just sort of moves all over the place and takes over but we call it vaporub here as the local name for it, because if you take a, a leaf and then you later on rub it, which is when you can get the essence, and this you don't even have to rub it, you can just smell it, and it smells like Vicks Vapor Rub. Whether it's an ingredient in Vicks Vapor Rub or not, I do not know, but I want to tell you a story about this one. This one I discovered much later, maybe 15 years ago. I was at a car wash, and I hadn't taken reading material. So I picked up one of those pop magazines here in here in San Miguel. And there was an article about Paul McCartney. And Paul McCartney had come to do a concert in Mexico City. And he developed a tremendous cold. I mean, he was so sick, they were almost going to cancel his concert. 
But one of the stagehands said, oh, no, 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 let me make him a tea, and made him a tea, it said there, with Vaporub. And what? He cleared out completely and was able to give the concert. So I went looking for the Vaporub, and I've seen now that you can buy some teas with it already in it, or you have it in your garden, you can inhale it to open your, um, your respiratory channels, but it is certainly part of the healing process that we use here. Over here, I have yerba buena. Uh, in another area, I have mint also, but this is spearmint. And this is used um, in teas that are very good for uh, stomach issues. Uh, and also, um, most many Mexican women put their uh, yerba buena in their uh, chicken consomme when they're cooking chicken. That's one of the reasons why when my mother, going back to her as a young woman in Massachusetts, and they say, would you like a cup of tea, Maria? And she turns and says, but I'm not sick. Why would I want a cup of tea? We also make tea with the leaves of the avocado tree. And those are wonderful. And I'll show you up here. And you can take the leaves and boil them. And the tea is uh, very, uh, it's, it's very nice. These little bubbles on the um, leaves are bugs that sort of nest in it, but they do not affect the fruit at all. And I always choose a clean leaf when I'm making my teas. This plant is Ruda, known as Rue, R-U-E in English. And this is uh, very common in most households. As a matter of fact, you'll see many um, times that uh, it is used for teas um, to balance energy. The idea being that it takes away bad energies. Uh, when I was in Mexico City outside of the pyramids near the Zócalo, the herbal healer said to come home and make a heavy roux tea and pour it into the bathtub and then soak in it. But he also waved it all over you and that was to clear your energies. I also know that it's very good for altitude sickness. It was tea of Ruda was given to us when we were students in college traveling through Peru uh, over the um, uh, Andes, and uh, everybody got uh, altitude sickness, and this is what they gave us. So it was very good for us. Over here, there is another plant. This is called Oja Santa. Uh, some people know it as the root, um, root beer plant because it's somehow related in the, in the flavor or the smell to the, to the root beer. And the friars discovered that this uh, tea made with this cured their bronchial so well that they decided to uh, call it a holy leaf. It's also known as hoja de acuyo. It will take over in your garden if you don't have it uh, controlled. Here I have it controlled in a pot. But also there's a couple of restaurants here where you can go and they will give you uh, eggs in an hoja santa leaf or a fried egg on top of an hoja santa. And I just use it very often in cooking, whether tamales or whether the eggs, and it's very tasty. Here we have a chaya. Chaya is the Mexican spinach bush. If you're in uh, the Yucatan area, where it's actually more abundant, there's actually some restaurants called chaya maya, and they'll make the lemonade with chaya in it. They'll make your eggs with chaya in it. Everything has chaya in it, and there's many different um, nutrients and it's an easy one to uh, just put into your scrambled eggs or whatever and the healing properties I'm just giving you a taste you'd have to look up all these different things it's too big a subject for me to try to cover in this talk over here though we have the epazote and the epazote is the one that um, is absolutely essential for uh, sopa de tortilla and also when you cook black beans, it keeps the flatulence down and it gets rid of uh, uh, different parasites. And um, it's known as worm seed in English and uh, very commonly um, used also just as a leaf in a quesadilla. Many, many of the herbs are basis of what now we know as back flowers and uh, the homeopathy. And so some of the things that I might mention that we could use as a fresh herb like arnica, which would be for if you've been had a, um, an accident and a bump on your head or a bruise on your leg, then you can take arnica tea. It's also very much when you've had dental surgery. And so now you can buy it many places in creams and in uh, 
homeopathic globules and everything else. But I want to tell you a couple of um, stories about a different one, which is Damiana. And so Damiana is the oregano family. Damiana is um, sold in the markets here uh, loose, or sometimes you can buy it in tea bags in certain uh, supermarkets. So my story goes like this. I was a young mother with a small child, and my little child seemed heavy in my arms. And I, I had had a bad, a bad time with my pregnancy, a difficult delivery, a car accident. And so I'd had a lot of things going on. And I would feel like if I didn't sit down, I was going to drop my child. So I'd have to just sit down in the middle of the room. And so um, we went to see several doctors that you know, had a little bit of information and they thought maybe it was juvenile arthritis beginning or some kind of rheumatism, whatever. And the healer woman that was working for me, uh, she said, well, Senora, you should, you should go check with the herb people. Uh, they might tell you what to take. And so I went down and explained and I was given Damiana Californiana. And you put some in water and you steep it and you make a tea and you drink the tea you know, several times a day instead of plain water. They call it using it as agua de uso, your water, your drinking water for the day. And so within a week, all my symptoms were gone, which was totally amazing to me. I later found out that it had a side effect, which was that it's an aphrodisiac. And therefore, uh, they make a wonderful liqueur with it. And this liqueur is um, in a beautiful bottle, which uh, looks like this. They have it in other presentations, but this is my favorite because of the bottle and all it suggests. And therefore, I was using my uh, Damiana liqueur when I was giving um, the talks in Mexican uh, cooking vacation and humoring and surprises in Mexican cooking and culture. And I wanted to get some extra bottles and I went looking and I couldn't find any in the uh, supermarkets or the liquor stores here in San Miguel. So I went looking in Querétaro and I went to the Europea and one store after another and they didn't have it. And finally they found it on the computer. There was one little location uh, far out of town where they had several bottles. And so I rushed over to get my Damiana uh, Californiana liqueur that I needed for my talks. And the woman that looked me up on the computer and brought it out, uh, she looked at me and she smiled and she said, us women, we like this, don't we? <laughs> so I bought quite a few bottles that particular time. So for the subject of uh, alcoholic beverages, I want to mention that the Spaniards brought wine and Spanish families still mostly drink wine. So do Europeans and many, many Mexican families have that background. But actually, in the more uh, indigenous families, the ones that were uh, had the culture of pre-Hispanic times, there's uh, several drinks. And one of them, that is the mezcal, which is uh, tequila is a type of mezcal, brings us to a saying that says, para todo mal, mezcal. Para todo bien, también. For anything that goes wrong, drink mezcal. And anything that goes right, also drink the scalp. Things that we use for when we're toasting are, there's a sort of a long version, which is beautiful. Dulce licor, bello tormento, que haces afuera, vente para adentro, you drink. And also, arriba, abajo, afuera y para adentro. And we will drink then our mezcal or tequila. I want to add a little story that I want to, um, share because tequila in its finest parts is always supposed to be drunk plain, straight, with a little chaser, sangrita, maybe some salt, maybe some lemon, but you drink your tequila straight. The idea of margaritas is quite recent and it has become popularized as though it were the Mexican drink of always. But I did, I did try once, I gave a little lecture in Querétaro when they were opening the uh, School of Gastronomy at the uh, Nash, uh, Autonomous University of Querétaro, I was invited to talk to students that were thinking about studying the culinary arts. And I did take it upon myself to reassure myself. And these 80 youngsters, I said, did anybody of you, a single one of you, ever see anybody in your family drink a margarita? And not one hand went up because that is only becoming fashionable 
and is delicious. And now people are beginning to accept it, but it has so much sugar in the margarita that it hits harder. So most people will have their tequila or their mezcal straight. So it seems that we are coming to an end. Este arroz ya se coció. This rice is done. And we can darle vuelo a la hilacha. Swing that dish rag around and go on merrily. Uh, I will say salud, dinero, amor y tiempo para gozar, gozarlo. I wish you health, money, love, and time to enjoy them all. Uh, in terms of what I have written, I would say buen provecho a la vida, buen provecho to the meal of life. And I want to close by telling you where you can buy my book, which is at the Biblioteca Pública, because you help support the projects that they have, which are many, uh, at the Biblioteca itself. And if you should need to uh, order one from outside of the country, or you can't get to the Biblioteca, then please, you can order directly from me, but there will be shipping costs.